I've entitled the message, From Gloom to Glory. From Gloom to Glory, amen? And it's good to be saved. Can I get a witness? I'll tell you, my, my life was once undone and, and just in despair and distraught and destroyed, really. And then all of a sudden, I met Jesus. And Jesus changes everything. And man, what a difference. I am so glad that I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, amen? And what a blessing. And I get to the joys of living the Christian life. In Acts chapter number 12, we're going to pick up in verse number 13. You know, it's never a good idea to attack the church of the living God or her members, amen? It's never a good idea. There's always a price that is associated with such a thing. Those that have always uh, done this have paid a severe price for doing so, as we're going to see in our text today. One should always be careful how they handle or speak of the Lord's church and their members. Amen. One should always be careful of that. And I'll tell you, if, if I think about so many people that should be a part of the local New Testament church. They should be in. They should be a part of it and, and receiving the benefits and the blessings of being a part of the church family. Amen. And uh, I, I just think about that and how wonderful it is. And we talked a little bit about that last week. And so, but as we jump into the text here, I wanted to get back to this point about where when Peter came and knocked on the door, you know, he's in prison, he's doomed to die the very next day. Herod was going to take him that night and uh, was going to put him to death and, and whatnot. And the angel of the Lord shows up, amen. Peter's snoozing, he's probably snoring pretty good. And, and uh, uh, the angel of the Lord has to come in and smote him on the side. Hey, wake up there, silly. It's time to get out of here. And so he gets him up, helps lift him up, and the chains fall off, the gates open, and he walks on out. And the whole time he's thinking it's just a dream or a vision. And all of a sudden he comes to himself and he's like, hey, this really happened, amen? And so I'm free. And so he ponders that a little bit. He heads to the house of Mary. And he gets there and he finds a bunch of people praying earnestly for him. They were praying without ceasing as we looked last week. And so he comes to the door and he knocks on the door. That's usually what you do when you show up at somebody's house. You knock on their door or you ring their doorbell. If you don't knock on their door or ring on their doorbell, you could be standing there for a very long time. And so anyways, just thought I'd give you some wisdom there, amen. And uh, you're going to show up at somebody's door. Don't just stand there, amen. Knock or ring the doorbell if they've got a doorbell. And uh, it's a good idea to also knock, even if they do have a doorbell, especially if you can't hear it ring. You know, sometimes you'll go and you'll pass a buzzer and you're like, I didn't hear that. And so, and that's not time to put your ear against the door because people driving by are going to think you're a little weird. And so it's time to just go ahead and knock. Amen. So there's some great wisdom from Pastor Frost for you, you know, when you show up at somebody's door next time. Okay. And so, uh, all right. So anyways, uh, let's take a look at this. Notice how the tables turn from gloom to glory. Amen. Let's take a look at this. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. I pray you bless the preaching of your word. I pray you'd help us today. Encourage us. And help us, if we have any gloom in our life, I pray, dear God, that you would help us to see just the glory, the wonder of it all. God, you're so good to us. And Lord, even in the worst of circumstances, God, you're in control. And you have a plan. And God, I thank you for your plan. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd work and move in our hearts and lives. Strengthen us now. Encourage us. And if by chance there is one here that's not truly saved, Lord, I pray today would be the day of salvation in that individual's life. We sure love you, we praise you, we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, the power of his blood we plead. Amen. And so as we look at this, the first thing I want you to notice, obviously, is the gloom. I want you to see the gloom here. Verse number 13, look at this with me, if you would, please. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. That's a wonderful thing to tell one of your sisters in Christ. Amen. Hey, look at that. Peter's out here. We've been praying for him to come, and, and he's out there. He's out there. 
you're crazy, you're mad. That's what they say, you're crazy. You don't know, your screws are loose in your head, amen. You don't know what you're talking about. And so anyway, she goes on and she affirms it in this passage. We see and uh, verse number 14, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. They said unto her, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. So we see the gloom here. These people are praying earnestly. They're praying without ceasing. They've been praying for several days now, as we looked at last week. And they get in there. God answers their prayer. But they really didn't think it was going to. I mean, it's pretty obvious from the passage that they didn't really believe that God was going to answer the prayer they were praying. So they were in gloom. They were downhearted about it. And then when this lady comes, and she, he's at the door. They didn't believe. They had no belief that God was going to answer this prayer. Because when somebody said he's at the door, you're crazy. You're mad. Are you with me? And so the first thing we see is their faith was weak. They didn't believe he was going to be delivered. They were praying that he would be, but they didn't believe it. And so there goes the whole thought and theory that if we don't believe something we're praying about, that it'll not happen. Are you with me? God answering your prayers is not dependent on your ability to believe it or not. Are you with me? Listen. He answered their prayer. They were praying for deliverance, and God mightily answered this prayer. Amen? They didn't believe it. We see in this, they call her mad. They say she's crazy. Ever been called crazy? I've been called crazy. Amen? You're mad. You're nuts. What are you thinking? And, uh, and it's not because I was acting silly either. And so, hey, listen, the bottom line is this right here. Some people think we're crazy for what we believe. Some think think we're crazy because you mean, you know, going to church once a week is pretty radical for most people today. (laughs) But to have somebody say that you go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and Friday, Friday and pray? Are you kidding me? What's the matter with you? You're crazy. Man, don't you have better things to do? Not really. Ain't got nothing better than being with Jesus and Jesus' people, amen? There's nothing like being in the house of God and the family of God and coming together and praying together and carrying one another's burdens together. Can I get a witness? There's nothing like that at all, amen? And boy, I'll tell you what, it's been amazing what God has been doing. He is awesome. They didn't believe it a bit. They said she was mad. Not only did they not believe that he was delivered, but when she continued to affirm he's at the door, they said, oh, he's dead. Herod Dunn killed him. He was going to take him tonight. They probably knew that. They probably heard the word that it was going to happen tonight. And, and they're, they're just like, you know, it's his angel. He's dead. It's over. Just as his spirit's at the door. That's what it is. Are you with me? I mean, they had so little belief, so little faith that God was going to answer this prayer. She's mad, and it's his spirit. And they're calling her crazy. Are you with me? <laughs> They're calling her crazy. There's, a, there's an angel at the door, and it's Peter. Are you kidding me? No, they're mad. They're crazy. They're the ones that are messed up because they didn't have faith in their God. I don't want to be too hard on them. I mean, honestly, they did see Stephen, the dip for one of the first deacons, one of the, one of the seven that were chosen to be a servant. Are you with me? Yep. They saw him martyred. But not only that, just a few days before this, they saw James, the sons of thunder, the first apostle, get martyred. Are you with me? James and John, they saw him get martyred. So, you know, I got to give them a little bit of room here, a little bit of space. And then I also got to realize I prayed for a lot of things in my life that I didn't really necessarily think were going to happen. But God is faithful. God is faithful, amen. And so we see here, What can I learn from this? My prayers are not necessarily answered according to the amount of faith I have in them being answered according to me praying. What did Jesus say? If thou believest, all things are possible unto them that believe. And the father of the son that was bound by a demon and casting himself into the fire and casting himself into the water, trying to destroy himself. And his dad's constantly having to try and rescue this kid. And he says, what did he say? I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. Because the bottom line is he'd been dealing with this kid for a long time. He'd been looking for an answer for a long time, and he found none. And most likely the last resort was the Lord. Are you with me? 
And so, but guess what happened? When you come to Jesus with something, whether you believe it or not, God's pretty powerful. <laughs> God's pretty amazing, amen. And according to his will, the prayer was answered, amen. And boy, when we look at this and we see this, an incredible truth that, listen, <laughs> their faith was weak, but let's be honest, their prayer was powerful. Their prayer was powerful. Go to James chapter number 5 with me, if you would, please. James chapter number 5. I, I love this text. I love it. It's an awesome passage of Scripture and talking about prayer. And you know where I'm going if you've, if you've been in the Bible much at all. James chapter number 5. Look at verse number 16 with me. James 5, verse number 16. I want you to see this. James 5, 16. James 5, 16, the Bible says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be what? Healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a who? Righteous man of great faith and belief availeth much. No, no, I just kind of added there, didn't I? It's not in there, amen? And when you look at this, it says, effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man. Who was praying? The church of the living God was praying. Do you think maybe that these believers had a, a little bit of righteousness about them? I'd say they were because they were what? Saved, amen? And the Bible says, listen, if we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And when you get born again, the Bible says you're placed into the body of Christ. You get put in Jesus, amen? And the bottom line is, is righteous people, because they're saved people, can I get a witness? Pray, God will answer that prayer if there's a couple other things in there. One, that they're fervent. What does that mean? They're just going to keep on praying. They're just going to keep on praying. They're just going to keep on praying. They're fervent about it. I'm just not giving up on this, Lord. And the Lord can say, no, but I'm not giving up, Lord. I'm going to keep on praying. I want this to happen, Lord. And the Lord will say, nope, not going to happen. And you just keep on praying. Just like that widow woman that had her son taken and, and killed, she wanted to be avenged of her adversary. Amen? And she went to that unjust judge, and she went after him day after day and taunted him and taunted him. And finally said, though I do not fear God, because this woman taunts me, I'm going to avenge her. And she got what she wanted. Why? As Jesus taught in that parable, because she just kept coming to the Lord. Amen. Amen? You don't have to believe or have some great faith to get God to answer your prayers. You just got to keep praying. You just got to keep praying. You just got to keep praying. They didn't believe this was going to happen. You're mad. There's no way that's going to take place. It's his angel. That's how stupid you are. Are you with me? That's what they're telling this damsel. And who's standing at the door knocking? The one that got delivered. Why? Because the church, it makes a point that the church was praying without ceasing. <laughs> There's a reason for that because God delivered Peter as a result of their prayer. Amen. And they didn't even believe it was going to happen. That's pretty incredible in my book. Amen. It just goes to show you that, hey, listen, not even your prayer life is dependent on you. Just like your salvation isn't dependent on you. Now, you've got to decide to pray. But listen to me. Just because you didn't live a perfect life today and lived in all holiness and you're walking on water and you got little wings floating off your back and you're, oh, I'm so godly. Ooh, all my prayers get answered. I don't think so, amen. Pray. Just pray. Can I get a witness? Pray. Don't give up. Don't quit on prayer. You might be one prayer away from getting it answered. Just keep on praying. And so as we look at this, we see here their prayer was powerful. And why? Because it was fervent. They prayed without ceasing, as we see in verse number 5 of our text. And also, it was effectual. You say, how do you know it was effectual? It wasn't because they were emotional in praying. Maybe they were. I don't know. But effectual doesn't mean they were emotionally and they were fervent doesn't mean, oh, God, please, God, answer my prayer. Like being that loud is going to make him hear you better. 
I'm thinking God can hear the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Amen? Now, I'm not against people that pray that way. I'm not making fun of them. I like to pray that way. Amen? I like to get passionate in my prayer. But it's passionate, not necessarily effectual. Because effectual prayer is effective. Amen? It's effective. Effectual. That means it accomplishes that what it went forth to do. And was their prayer effectual or wasn't it? Peter was delivered. I'm thinking it was pretty effectual. Amen. It was an effective prayer right there. Amen. He got what he asked for. They got what he asked, they asked for. Peter was delivered in an incredible deliverance. The most secure and most secure prison there could be he was in. He had four quintorians of soldiers around him. He had to pass through, through two different wards of soldiers. I mean, it was pretty effectual. Amen. He got delivered from all that. It wouldn't have mattered if the entire Roman army had surrounded him and God wanted him delivered, he'd have been delivered. And so the bottom line is, is their prayer was effective. John 3, 1 John 3, 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There are some conditions. You got to be obedient. Are you with me? I was talking to the men this morning. I want my life to be pleasing. I want my life to be pleasing to the Lord. I don't want it to be pleasing to anybody else, and I hope it is. I hope my life is pleasing to my wife. I believe that it is. But number one, the person I'm trying to please in my life is not my wife. It's my Lord. Amen? Are you with me? So be pleasing to the Lord. What were these people doing? They'd been praying for several days. I'm thinking that kind of prayer pleases God. And every day you're praying for something, just keep praying. Are you with me? If you can breathe, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, That tells me that you can pray. Are you with me? Because if you have breath, you can still pray. When you stop breathing... I give you permission to stop praying. Are you with me? Your pastor gives you permission to not be a prayer warrior anymore. You want to know why? Because you're going to be in heaven, amen. Hallelujah. And it's not longer praying anymore. It's a face-to-face communication. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Can I get a witness? Listen, their faith was weak. Their prayer was powerful. And why? Because their God is awesome. That's right. Come on. Their God is awesome. Come on. Is not your God awesome? Yes. If your God is their God, then your God is awesome. Amen? Absolutely. Their God is my God. I'm saved. I'm born again. He's my Jesus. Can I get a witness? Amen. Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I've got direct access to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I get a witness? Go over to 1 Timothy with me. 1 Timothy. I want you to see this. This is really good too. 1 Timothy, that's right before 2 Timothy. Yes, 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Verse number 5. And most people, when they read this, they tune into that mediator part of it. But I want you to tune into something a little bit different. For there is what? One God and one mediator between God and what? Men. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. There's one God and one mediator between Christ and men. So the mediator and the one God is talking about Jesus in that passage. Are you with me? That is a direct reference to Jesus being God. And listen to me. If you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, say amen. Amen. You have direct access to God, Jesus Christ, God the Father. Are you with me? You have direct access. And so because our God is awesome, He does do all things well. 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Listen to me, the people that you're dealing with in your life, the enemies that you're dealing with in your life, listen to me, don't sweat it. God's got this thing under control. You don't have to fight that battle, let God fight it, amen? 
You don't have to stand up for yourself. Let God stand up for you. Can I get a witness? Hey, listen. Hey, the church didn't go storm the jail and deliver him, did they? Trying to control it themselves and handle it. Let's get our swords and our pitchforks and our spears and our, and our, and our spatulas from the kitchen. And let's go get Peter out of prison. No. What did they do? They left it in God's hands. Are you with me? And you need to leave some things in your life in the hands of God. Are you with me? You've got to give it to Jesus. And how are you going to do that? You just stop trying to figure it all out and pray. And pray some more. And pray some more. And then let God open the doors appropriate for you. Can I get a witness? Man, I'm telling you what, it's an incredible thing. You know that woman with the issue of blood for 12 years? You know what? When she finally stopped trying to pay the doctors to fix everything and she stopped trying to figure it all out, what did she do? She went where she's going to get the real help, Jesus. And you know what? She didn't have to do some miraculous act of, of ceremony or some miraculous faith step. All she had to do was go to Jesus and if I could just but touch the hem of his garment just kind of snuck in behind him, didn't want to be noticed, wasn't trying to get accolades, and just touched the hem and immediately. 12 years of plague was gone. And you want to know why? Because she just got to Jesus. And you know how we get to Jesus today? Prayer. Prayer. Loving Jesus, amen prayer. Isaiah 26 verses 3 and 4, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. Church, trust ye in the Lord forever. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. It ain't in these two muscles up here that I like to call thunder and lightning but listen they're in the lord amen that's where real strength is and so as we look at this we see this man i'm telling you something right now hey listen we see their gloom their gloom was is they didn't believe that peter was going to get delivered they believed they were going to have another funeral is what they believed they believed that there was going to be another time of mourning they believed there was going to be another martyr in the local new testament church and his name was peter that's what they believed they were they were sad But praise be to God, God turned their gloom to glory. Amen. Amen. Not only do we see the gloom, but I also want you to see the doom. I want you to see the doom. There's gloom, but there's also doom in this story. Can I get a witness right there? The enemy of the Lord in his church, there's doom involved in this rascal. Look at it with me, if you would, please. Verse number 18. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. What was become of Peter? Can I get a witness right here? They woke up and the guy that was snoring between them that they were all snuggled up to, they probably got a little chilly that night and started waking up, man, like they'd lost their blanket. Amen. And all of a sudden they look over and there's nothing there but a pile of cold chains and shackles. And they're like, what in the world? And that gate door was open when they woke up. And then they walked on through, there's another gate that's open, and another gate that's open, and another door that's open. And they're like, where is he? And they probably searched high and low for him because they knew the trouble that they were in. Their life was in danger. These people that so securely secured Peter for fear of losing him. No doubt they probably heard the story of the Lord in the tomb and the two soldiers. And it was passed on down through the ranks, even though they told those soldiers and paid them and bribed them to lie about what happened with Jesus' body. They probably told their fellow comrades, this is what really happened. And they were probably scared to death they were going to lose Peter. Amen. And so as we look at this and we see this, man, the doom. Proverbs chapter number 8, verse number 36, listen to this. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Can I get a witness? You know, there's somebody that hated the church. His name was Herod. He was the king. Verse number one, we see in verse number one, he stretched forth his hands to 
to vex certain of the church. You stress your hand towards the wrong thing, friend, and now you're going to pay the price for it. It was against the church. We see that in verse number one. But not only was it against the church, but it was also against the lost. It was against the lost. These two soldiers, look at it now, these soldiers that were there. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to what? Do you think they died? You better believe they did. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. Herod didn't like having his plans foiled. He was upset about it. He says, I'm getting out of here. I, he, he's embarrassed by the fact that he's lost Peter. He was, he was about to do another display of, of, of joy for the Jews because the Jews were looking forward to it. They were trying, he was trying to continue to win their favor and make them happy and all of those kind of things. And so he just gets out of there and he heads down to, to this, uh, really, it's kind of a capital of Rome at the time. It's kind of a high point in Rome. It's, a, it's a, a center point in this area of the world for Rome and whatnot. And there was a couple of cities here that were fed by this city by the king's table and nourished by the king's country, so to speak. And so as you look into verse number 20, and Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country, okay? And so anyways, he's down there and, and because he didn't get what he wanted to do, what does he do? What does most you know, petty kings and rulers do? Instead of turning their attention to the problem and turning attention to fixing and solving problems, they just turn their anger to something else. Are you with me? What happened in our 2016 election? Instead of winning the election and, and petty and pouting and whatnot, instead of dealing with it and trying to really honestly learn how to win the next election, what do they do? They start attacking the president that did win. They're just pouting. And they're attacking him and destroying him. So what does this king do? He starts turning his attention to a couple other little places, that a couple other little cities that were, were uh, uh, he had evidently was mad at them about something. We don't know what it was, but he had turned his attention to them and they wanted peace. And so they had made friends with one of his closest counselors, his chamberlain. And uh, 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 so therefore they had an inroads, amen. And so instead of doing things the proper way, sometimes you just got to go through the back door with those greasy hands and slimy things and do things wickedly. And that's what wicked people do. Yep. Look at this now. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. Was Herod a good king? No, he wasn't. He was a wicked and an evil and an unlawful man. That's what he was. He was, he's, he, hey, listen, he, he had crimes against the church. He had crimes against the lost. He had those men executed and he attacked these two other cities. He attacked these two other and had a disposition against them and for no good reason. But not only against them, but the biggest problem he had was against the Lord. That's right. Look what it says in this passage. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a what? God, and not of a man. Why did those people say that? Because they feared him. Not because they really thought he was a God. But he accepted their praise. He accepted their glory to him. A glory that only belongs to one. And that's the God of heaven and earth. And his crimes against the Lord was is that he stole the glory that God shares with no one. Can I get a witness? And so we see in this passage in verse number 22, he stole the Lord's glory. Isaiah chapter number 42, verse number 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Can I get a witness? He doesn't share his glory. Exodus chapter number 34, verse number 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous, yes. amen, yes. is a jealous God. He, listen to me, church, he is not going to share his worship and his glory with anything else. So you better be careful about worshiping your spouse. You better be careful about worshiping your kids because God will take those things from you. No problem at all. Listen to me. He does not share His glory. Can I get a witness? 
And so we better be careful as a church that we don't give worship to something else because God can remove that from our lives quickly and sadly may remove us as well. So we see Herod's uh, uh, crimes, but we also see Herod's condemnation. Look at it with me in verse number 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the what? Glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Notice the order of this. Before he gave up the ghost, he was what? He was eaten of worms. Now, there was a disease in that day that was a worm. And it was an intestinal disease. It was inside the body. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had anything eaten at you, it doesn't feel good. Are you with me? Ever, anybody ever been bit by a dog? Gotten bit by a dog? You've been bit by a dog, Karen. I know you have. And uh, your hand got bit from that dog down on the road. And so I remember that. And eventually, you know, you have as many dogs as you do. You're going to get bit by a dog. Amen? <laughs> and so <laughs> the bottom line is, is this right here. I've been bit by a dog. I think many of us would say there's been times we've been bit by a dog. Does it feel good? Is that the way that feels? Can you imagine having a gazillion little worms inside of you eating your intestines out? Can you imagine that? That's got to be painful. And according to the, yeah, according to what history teaches about that disease, it was a very painful death. And there was no relief from it to be eaten of worms, and then he gave up the ghost. And why? Because God touched him and smote him. Because he stole God's glory. Are you with me? A glory that only belongs to God himself. Can I get a witness? So we see this doom. Turn over. It not only was it intestinal, but it was also, listen to that. Well, let me give you a couple of verses here. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. Can I get a witness? You want to pursue evil? Listen to me. It goes to death. When sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth what? death. Amen. Isaiah 66, 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, God talking, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorring unto all flesh. Can I get a witness? Not only was it intestinal, but it was an eternal condemnation. Go over to Mark chapter number nine with me, if you would, please. Mark chapter number nine. We're going to talk about the indestructible worm, the indestructible worm, Mark chapter number nine. Hey, listen, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of worms in my life and they're not hard to kill, but there's a worm that's coming for the lost that will never die. It will never end. It will never be destroyed. It is forever and ever and ever. Can I get a witness? Mark chapter number 9, look at it with me, verse number 43. And if they hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm, say it with me, dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There is a worm in that place called hell in eternity that a person is going to be consumed by that worm for all of eternity. Their pain will never cease. Their sorrow will never cease. It's not like today sometimes you just, when you have an ache or a pain, and you just kind of learn to live with it. That's not the way hell's going to be. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be awful. They're going to scream and moan and cry out for all of eternity. God help us. I tell. I know there's people you know that you love and people you know that you don't love. Maybe not even alike. But I don't want anybody to go to this awful place where the worm dieth not and the fire's not quenched for all of eternity. Oh, he didn't just say it once. Look at it. Verse number 45. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter, halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, then pluck it out. 
It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Listen, there's an eternity coming for those that don't know Jesus as their personal Savior, and there's a worm there that's going to eat them and eat them and eat them, and they're going to suffer, and they're going to be in torment, and they're going to be in pain and the fire is going to burn them and burn them and burn them and they're going to cry out and there'll be no relief. God help us. Why are we so caught up in foolish things of this world? Care more about the car we drive or the house we live in or this thing that we want to do while people are dying and going to hell. God help us. Church, we've got a God that is there waiting for us to witness. A God ready to win somebody. A God desiring right there waiting to hear you give those gospel words to somebody. Somebody who wants to hear your prayer as you pray for that lost individual. Do you have a prayer list of lost people that you're praying for every day? God help us. gloom. But man, the gloom we face day to day, the sufferings we have, even if Peter would have died, it's not a mourning thing. It's a celebration. He's saved, going to heaven. And he died for the cause of Jesus Christ as a martyr. The rewards for a martyr is pretty good. (laughs) Are you with me? It's gloom, but our gloom has nothing compared to their doom. Nothing compared to their doom. Are you with me, church? You say, I just don't know if I can afford to give to, 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 to the missions program at Solid Rock Baptist Church. I just don't know if I can do that. Are you kidding me? Cut your cable. Are you kidding me? Kill your internet. Are you kidding me? Take one less trip a week in gas and give that gas money to Jesus. And get these missionaries the money they need to do the work they're doing. Are you with me? I guarantee you, Brother Money needs more money. I talked, I gave testimony. He had $120,000 given in two months so that he could get a couple of scripture projects done to translate into languages that don't have a Bible. Are you with me? Do you think maybe Bearing Precious Seed could use a little bit more money? Do you think maybe there's some missionaries down there that could use a little bit more help? Do you think maybe there's some other people that are trying to get on the field and there's very little amount of time and these deputation missionaries, they call, sorry, can't, can't, can't do it right now. We don't have enough money. But we can drive a new car. We can put a new addition on our house. We can get some new curtains when there's nothing wrong with the old ones. We can buy some more clothes. We can get this and get that. And we can have food rotting in our refrigerator instead of being better stewards and putting that money towards the cause of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? I hope you are. Because there's people all around the world dying and going to hell. And you know what the Bible says? Listen, if it's your eye, your hand, your foot, your arm, your leg, cut it off and don't go to hell. And if God's saying that to lost people, I wonder what he's saying to us that are saved. Hmm? Amen. Cut off the desires that aren't kingdom focused. Seek ye first the what? Kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And then all these things that we spend our life collecting and gathering up, those things will be added to us by default because our focus is on the kingdom. Are you with me? It's not like you're losing anything. Actually, you're gaining everything. You're gaining everything because the things you live for now, if it isn't kingdom focus, those things are going to be wasted. But as soon as you get kingdom focus and you get your eyes on the kingdom and you're seeking God's kingdom, all of a sudden, all those things that were going to be ruined, now all of a sudden they have eternal value. Are you with me? Because they're kingdom focused. You received those things because you were focused on the kingdom. And when you're focused on the kingdom, those things will be used for God. Can I get a witness? Listen, the one thing there should never be is there should never be need in the house of God. 
there should be plenty of resources because you can't outgive God. I don't even understand. I mean, give, and, uh, give until it just hurts. And man, I'm telling you what, you'll find out that hurt turns into blessing. That hurt turns into help. That hurt turns into, woo, hallelujah, because God does some amazing things. Listen, the gloom, the doom, Herod, for all of eternity, still today, eaten by a worm, a worm that won't die, a fire that won't be quenched. How sad, amen. But praise be to God, there's the gloom and there's the doom. But man, I'll tell you something right now. There's the boom. <laughs> there's the boom, amen. Look at it with me. Verse number 24. But the word of God did what? Grew and what? Multiplied. Boom. Amen. The word of God. It grew and it multiplied. Yes, the church has enemies. Yes, the child of God has enemies. You've got enemies in your life. If you don't know it, trust me, they're there. They're around. They're trying to devour you. They're trying to wear you out. The devil's trying to wear out the saints of the living God. But there's the boom. And the word of God grew and multiplied. That's an awesome thing. He stretched his hand out to vex the church, certain of the church. Killed James, martyr, sad. Sure, he was slain by the sword. Probably wasn't fun. But you know what? He's in glory with Jesus. No worms there. Amen? No fire there. Amen? Can I get a witness? He's with Jesus. And man, I'm telling you something right now. The stories of the martyrs and the people that have died for the cause of Jesus Christ by the enemy, you read those things, and while they were being tortured, they were in the presence of Jesus, and those people would cry out, don't stop. His presence is so real. Hurt me more, please. Oh, it's so amazing. There wasn't pain. <laughs> there was just blessing. Are you with me? And we get so caught up in the earthly things of this world. And boy, I'll tell you what, what a blessing. Man, the boom. We see the power of God's word. So, verse 20 of chapter 19, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Don't you love that? I just love it when I read that the word of God prevailed. And you know what? You just keep on giving out the Word of God. Listen to me. You may have passed out gazillions of tracts and John and Romans, and you may have held that sign 150,000 times, and people ignored you and walked by you, but the Word of God always prevails because God promised His Word would accomplish that which He sent it forth to accomplish. Can I get a witness? And so it's never in vain to put the Word of God out there. And the Word of God, He said, hey, listen, this rascal persecuted the church. He killed James. He took Peter. I delivered Peter by the prayer of the church. And listen, the bottom line is, is as a result of that persecution, the Word of God grew and multiplied. Boom! Amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah chapter number 46, verse number 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient days the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Can I get a witness? The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is pure. Every Word of God is pure. Every bit of it. Not just some of it, amen. You can't pick and choose some of the words out of there and say, this one's pure and this one, I, this one's not for me, amen. This one over here, I like it. No, no, no. You got to take the whole thing, amen. It's all pure. It's all good. It's all powerful. Amen. Can I get a witness? And it's pure. Amen. Not only is it pure, but it's also perfect. Go to, I, go, go over it. Yeah, let's do this. Amen. These aren't in my outline, but it's just good peas. I like peas. Amen. Peas are good. I even like the little green ones, but my favorite is right out of the can. Amen. And they got that canned flavor and they're a little mushy and saucy and slimy. Oh yeah, that's good stuff. Amen. And so Psalm chapter number 19, look at it with me. Psalm chapter number 19, amen. Not only is it powerful, not only is the word of God pure, but it's perfect. It's perfect. Look at it with me. 
Verse number seven, if you're there, say amen. I'm going to dehydrate up here if I don't drink some water. Hallelujah. The water of the word, amen. <clears throat> it's amazing, the word of God. Verse number seven, look at it. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is what? Sure. Making wise the simple. Listen to me. Not only is the word of God powerful and it's pure, but it's perfect. You know what else it is? You want to know what else it is? It's permanent. <laughs> it's permanent. Hey, listen, you could take this Bible. You could take every Bible in this room. You could take every Bible in the entire world. You could put it in a big pile and have a big bonfire. You could do that. Burn them all. But you know what? It's not settled just in a, on this book, in this page. It's not just physical, amen. It's spiritual. Amen. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall not pass it abideth forever amen the word of god which liveth ah oh, you got to go there let's go there first 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 up uh, uh, first peter first peter you got to see this, this is good you're going to like this and if you don't like it i'll pray for you oops that's the wrong thing i just did oh well we'll figure it out later <clears throat> first peter look at it with me Verse number 22, if you're there, say amen. Seeing ye have what? Purified your souls in doing what? Obeying the what? Truth, the word of God. Amen. You purified your souls. How'd you do it? Obeying the truth through the spirit. And so you just can't physically do it. It's got to be a spiritual obedience. Amen. Look at it now. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, by the word of God. Are you with me? And this is what the word of God does, which what? Liveth and what? Abide. It is permanent. But hey, listen, listen to me. It's alive. That book that you're holding in your hand, it's alive. Hey, listen, that book breathes. Are you with me? That is a breathing book. If you'll get real quiet in the morning, you'll hear it breathe. Amen. When you walk with God. Amen. Are you with me? <laughs> Man, it's good. Amen. It's alive. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration. The inbreathing of God. That book, it breathes. We want to know why? Because it's living. That's not a dead book. Amen. You can do whatever you want. You can throw it out the window. It's going to be alive. And you know what? You can try to erase it from your mind and your heart and your life. But the bottom line is, is God's word breathes and it's alive. And you know what? If you've ever heard it or you've ever read it, whether lost or saved, it will haunt you for the rest of your life. Can I get a witness? And those people that choose to reject Christ as their Savior are going to be in eternity hearing the breathing of the Word of God as a torment in their life because they rejected Jesus. Can you imagine being in hell and having heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for all of eternity crying out, why did I reject you? As you're in pain and horror and torment. Because I'm pretty sure that's the only thing they're going to be thinking about. Are you with me? Man, I'm telling you something right now. <sighs> church. Church, the Word of God, it booms. It booms. It is going to grow. It is going to flourish. It is going to do what it's supposed to do. Are you going to be a part of that boom? Are you going to be a part of it? Are you hearing me? Are you going to be a part of it? Liveth and abideth forever. It is powerful. It is pure. It is perfect. And it is permanent. It will never pass away. Everything else will. But listen, it never will. Can I get a witness? The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is so powerful. 
John chapter number 10, verse number 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Can't be broken, amen? This book is powerful. It'll never go away. It will be held true. And not only that, we see the power of the word of God, but we also see the prosperity of God's people. Look at verse number 25. Boom. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had what? Fulfilled their ministry. Where were they? They were in Antioch, where the disciples were called Christians first. Are you with me? It is beyond me why somebody would get offended when I, I, I taught this in that message. It is beyond me why somebody would get offended because I said saved people aren't Christians unless they're disciples. Followers of Jesus. Are you with me? Those were the ones that were called Christians first. The disciples. What is a disciple? Somebody that follows and obeys the teachings of Jesus. Amen. That's what Christian means. To be like Christ. Listen to this now. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. We continue to read the book of Acts, and we'll get to this at some point. But John Mark departed from Paul and, and Barnabas under a time of persecution and heavy heat. Paul then no longer trusted him and said, I'm not taking him. Caused a division between Paul and Barnabas, but what happened? Now you got two missionary groups going out instead of just one. And so God does all things well. And then later on, Paul says, bring John Mark with you because he is profitable to me for the ministry. You want to know what? Listen, God's people increase and grow. That's what they do do. Are you with me? And so when somebody tells me they're saved or they tell me they're a Christian and there's no growth, I struggle with that. Can I get a witness? The prosperity of God's people. They finished the work that they had to do in Antioch in their ministry. They came back to Jerusalem and they brought John Mark with them. Amen? And John Mark was just beginning to become a great man used for God. And so the prosperity of God's people. 2 Corinthians 2.14, listen, this is the great thing about it. When somebody's truly saved, they can get knocked down and they'll do what? Get back up. 2 Corinthians 2.14, now thanks be to God, which always causeth us to what? Triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Amen. And maketh manifest the savor of of his knowledge by us in every place. We triumph in Christ, and we always triumph in Christ. And as we're triumphing in Christ, and we're passing the word of God along, and we're serving the Lord, all of a sudden, God makes this manifest savor. Kind of like a good beef stew or a, a delicious steak with fries. And you can just smell that savor coming through. And you get that grill and you slap them juicy hamburgers on there. And you can smell it. And when, when the child of God, when a child of God is serving the Lord in the spirit of God, not in their own strength, but by the Spirit, man, you can just smell it, and it smells good. It's a savor, not a nasty smell, amen? Hallelujah. God's people, the prosperity of God's people. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Isaiah chapter number 41, and we're coming to a close. Isaiah chapter number 41. Isaiah chapter number 41. When you get to Isaiah 41, let me know with an amen. Isaiah chapter number 41, look at verse number 10 with me if you would please. 
fear thou not. Too many Christians are living in fear, amen? amen. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. If you're saved, say amen. amen. God is with you. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. If Jesus is your God, say amen. amen. You don't have to be dismayed. I will strengthen thee if you love me the way I want you to. If you do exactly as I say and never ever sin again, I will strengthen thee. Amen. Amen. Yea, I will what? If you're helpable. Some people, you just can't help them, you know. Now, that's true on my end. Some people I can't help, but God can help anybody. Are you with me? Look at it now. Look at what it says. Yea, I will what? Uphold thee with the right hand of whose righteousness? I'm going to be held up by my own righteousness. What did I say? Thunder and lightning. No, I don't think so. Amen. His right hand. Amen. Which is a whole lot more faithful than these hands right here. God help us. Amen. Verse number 11. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. And they that strive with thee shall what? Those are our enemies. And do you know who the real enemy is? Because Jesus, but the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus, our, our, our war is not with flesh and blood. Principalities, powers, amen. Who's, who's that? Satan and his imps, amen. That's the battle. It's a spiritual warfare, amen. And, and this, is a, this is a follow-up with that. All those, those imps, amen. Verse number 12, thou shalt seek them and shalt not find them. And I've read this verse, even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. You know, I always love it when I see a parent with their kids and they got their kids' hands in their hands and they're walking with them, amen, and they're right beside them. And, and you know that protection, like you're staying with me and let somebody try to, you take a mom, her grip becomes like Hercules as soon as somebody tries to steal their kid, amen? And just about, I, I remember that story in Florida where this little boy got too close to the water and that gator grabbed him. And mama went out there and grabbed that kid's arms and she won. She won the tug of war. And when he was in the hospital, a reporter came in and asked him, and his, hand, his arms were all scarred up in bandages. And he said, what's the bandages on there? He said, well, let me show you. And he pulled the bandage away, and there was all these scars on his arms. And he was all proud. He's like, he's like, what are those from? That's where my mom's nails wouldn't let me go. Amen? Amen? Get that. You think God's less? He's got you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. I love it. For I, the Lord, God, I, the Lord, thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Amen? God's our helper. The one who made heaven and earth, that's my help. The one who controls all things, that's my help. Are you with me? And not only is God so awesome, but he's given me a book that is so awesome. It's powerful, it's pure, it's perfect, amen, and it is permanent. So you can count on it, amen. This book is incredible, and he's given us his book. And so what it says, you can trust it. You can count on him, amen. God is faithful. And listen, I don't know about you, but I want my life to be prosperous. I want my life to be successful, not in the eyes of men, but in the eyes of God. Amen. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would please. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. He is faithful. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, Lord. I pray you'd help us today. Thank you for all that you do for us. God, thank you for turning my gloom into glory. 
thank you for taking my despair and my dismay and my lost condition and giving me hope. Thank you for taking this little helpless man and giving me hope and help and giving me heaven. God, thank you. You're so faithful. Lord, I pray you'd help these, your saints. Lord, I pray you'd help them and strengthen them. God, please, help us to see the glory and not focus on the gloom. Help us to recognize the doom of the lost. Help it to break our hearts so that we do something about it. Father, we sure do love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you do for us. Pray you bless now this invitation. Do what only you can do in hearts and lives. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. The power of his blood we plead. Amen. If God spoke to your heart, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? If God spoke to your heart. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? God has no pleasure in the lost going to hell. He wants them to turn and have life. your prayer life church are you fervent are you effectual god takes care of his children amen get your eyes off the gloom get your eyes on the glory because he is faithful